All right, let's take a look at exercise interface. We'll concentrate on the tools we're going to use the most. Let's begin with the views. When we start, the program opens with four views. We have the top, the front, the right, and the camera, or a perspective view. These are the four default views. On the left side, we have the toolbar, where we can get different tool sets depending on the mode we are in. We have model. We can change from model, animate, render, simulate, and hair. We can select the tools by clicking on the mode, or by pressing 1, 2, 3, or 4 on the keyboard. Let's switch back to number 1 for model. Under the tools, you'll see our six display layouts. By clicking on them, we can change the layout in our views. By default, we are in a four view layout. We can change it to a two view layout, a three view layout, and so on. We're going to work in this four view layout. Under the layout buttons, we see three more icons. The first one will return us to this main toolbar. The second one is a brush that we will use when we paint weights and textures for our objects. The third one is a palette icon we can use to select colors for our objects in different display modes. Switch back to the main toolbar. We can resize our views by selecting the edge, clicking, and dragging. If we want to restore it to its original position, we just middle click in the center of the views and it will reset to the default for view. We can also maximize these windows by left clicking on this small icon in the corner. To restore, left click again. On the right side of the interface, we have the main command panel. This main command panel is divided into the select panel, the transform panel, snap, constrain, and the edit panel. Let's get our first model, a sphere. Under model, select primitive, polygon mesh, sphere. Hey, hey, our first sphere. The window that appears is called the property editor. We'll go through the property editor in the next couple chapters. For now, let's just close the window. By default, our sphere is selected. If we left click anywhere outside the sphere, we'll deselect the sphere. To select it again, we can either press the space bar, click on this big arrow to get to selection mode. Now we can click and drag and select our sphere. Deselect and select it again. In the select panel, I get the name of the selected object and the different components that we can select from within that object. We have edges, which are the yellow lines within the model, polygons, which are the faces in between those yellow lines, and points. By dragging a rectangle, I can select the points, the polygons, or the edges, and then click Object, switch back, select the entire object. Below in the transform panel, I get values for scale, rotation, and translation. XSI is a really neat tool that remembers the last selection of each button. With the sphere selected, hit delete on the keyboard to delete it. If we want to get that exact same model back, we could go back and, cl and click primitive polygon mesh, sphere, or we could middle click the mouse over the primitive button. XSI remembers the last model we got and gives us the exact same sphere. Now if you take a look around the interface, you'll notice uh, small arrows in the corners of most buttons. This means when you click on that option, the drop down menu will appear. If you press on select, we'll see a menu appear. The same in transform, edit, and a lot of others around the interface.
let's take a look at one of our primitive models and how we can move them around the scene. We go to our model toolbar, go to primitive, polygon mesh, cube. Let's move this window, which is the property editor, and adjust the length of the cube to make it a little smaller. We can drag the slider to make it smaller. Or if we want to be more exact, we can click on the numbers here, put in a numeric value, press enter, and we get a specific value. We'll go into detail on the property editor a lot more later. Now that the cube is smaller, I can see it in the three views. Top, front, right, and my camera perspective view. Click on where it says wireframe, Go down to shaded view, left click. This will make our objects easier to see. The first thing we're going to do to understand perspective is to move the camera around. Press and release the S key on your keyboard. Notice how the mouse pointer changes its icon. If you look at the bottom of the XSI interface, you'll notice an L, M, and R information toolbar. These relate specifically to the tool you currently have selected and inform you of what action the left, middle, and right mouse buttons will currently perform. You want to train yourself to look down to this area as you investigate each new tool. With our left mouse button, we can track or pan around. With the middle mouse button, I can zoom in or out. And with the right mouse button, I can orbit the camera around an object. In the top, front, and right views, I can use the middle mouse button to zoom in and zoom out, and the left mouse button to pan around. But in these views, we cannot orbit our camera. Let's get another primitive. Primitive, polygon mesh, sphere. Let's make it a bit smaller. Close the property editor. If you notice, my mouse pointer is still in the camera navigate tool. And I still have the sphere selected. If I want to select the cube, we have several choices. One is to click on this big arrow in the right command panel, which will get us back to selection mode. Now that I have an object selected, I can see its transform values, which are scale, rotation, and translation. We could also press the space bar to get us back to selection mode. We'll go over even more options for selecting objects in just a few minutes. Now let's quickly talk about the three fundamental transformations we can apply to our geometry. Scale is the size of the object, rotation, its orientation, and translation is the location of the object in the scene using a coordinate system. Let's click on the T, which means translation, and three colored arrows appear on the object. They represent X, Y, and Z on the translation menu. The Y, for example, which can move our object up and down. So for example, if I want the cube to the right, we can click the red X and drag. This works in a coordinate system. X, positive and negative. Y, positive and negative. And Z, positive or negative. In this case, Z negative is towards the camera, or towards us. So let's click and select the X without releasing the mouse button and drag to the right. Now if I want to move the sphere to the left, I can either press the space bar or click the big arrow, select, move to the left. Let's get another primitive. Polygon mesh, cone, Close the property editor. Now I have three models that I can see here, but in my camera view, I can't see all three models completely. We're going to move the camera backwards so we can see all the models. Now this time, instead of pressing and releasing the S key, let's press and hold S on the keyboard. Click the middle mouse button, hold it, move the camera backwards. 
Now when I release the S key, my icon will return to the previous tool, which in this case is the transform tool. And we can continue to move the object around. This function of leaving a key pressed is called the sticky tool. And is very useful. Let's do it again with the sphere. Go to the selection mode, select the sphere, select the translation tool. If I want to move the sphere farther away from my grid, I can just move it up to this point. So I need to move my camera backwards. Press and hold the S key. Middle click, hold and move the camera back. And now when we release S, we're back to our translation tool. We can continue to move the sphere around. Now I'm going to press spacebar to return to my selection mode. Or we'll press the S and leave it pressed. Move my camera around, and when I release the S, I return to my selection mode. The difference, if I do a simple press and release with the S key, the selection tool will remain until we select a new tool. The other way is to press, leave it pressed, and when you release, it will automatically return to the previous tool. Okay, let's get another model. Primitive, Polygon Mesh, Torus. Let's click and maximize the window to get a better view of the scene. Select the translation tool, move the torus. Selection mode, select the sphere. Let's try to place the sphere inside the torus. So if we go to our translation tool, move to the right, and move on the Z backwards. As you can see, you know, moving in perspective can be a bit tricky, especially when you want to get things exact. Uh, if we look at our position coordinates, it says here about minus 10 and minus 12 in Z. Now if we select the torus, we see we have negative uh, 8 and negative 11 something. Let's click inside the box and put a specific numeric value. Negative 9 and negative 11. Select the sphere. Click on translation and put in the same negative 9, negative 11. This way we'll guarantee the sphere and the torus are on the screen in the exact same position. And we can make sure of that in our top view. Press S to move backwards. Move around, zoom a little bit. Now you can see we're sure the sphere and the torus are in the exact same position. Let's get a cube to add a floor. Primitive, polygon mesh, cube. Now we're going to use a right view to make it easier to place the floor. So we maximize the right view. S and move backwards. Now select the scale tool. Click in the middle, here in the box, which will uniformly scale on all three axes. Select the green handle, scale it only vertically. Choose our translation tool and drag the green handle to place it beneath the cube. If we go back to our camera view, Press G on the keyboard, and this will turn off the grid. Might make it a little easier to see. Press the S, move around the camera. There, yeah, move around. So, really, the way to work is to mainly use the perspective or the camera view 
to use the top, front, and right views to help you move objects around the scene and make sure they're in their correct position. Let's say you want to put the cone on top of the cube, but you want it upside down. So let's rotate our cone. Select the rotation tool. Drag the blue icon around manually. We can click and drag on any axis we want. In this case, we want the blue. And notice the value changing. It's almost reaching negative 180. So we can click on the box and write it manually. Negative 180. To make it exact, enter. Now we'll translate our cone. And in the front, it appears as though the cone is correctly placed. But if you look at the top and the right views, you'll notice that it's not in the position we want. So we can use our right view to move the cone. Now you'll see we have the cone correctly placed. If we click and hold the S key, left mouse button, middle mouse button, left mouse button, right mouse button. Now go to our selection tool, spacebar, press anywhere to deselect the object. Let's place these two objects on top of the cone. So click and drag, make a selection box around both objects. Select our translation tool, move up, left, move right. Right about there. Hold down the S key, move a little backwards, orbit around, spacebar or arrow to selection mode, drag to deselect, move the camera around a little bit more. There you go. Let's continue exploring the primitive menu. We're going to click on the little scissor here to extract the menu and take a closer look. First, we have the null object. Null objects are useful in complex groups, allowing the adjustment of one null to control the parameters of many objects parented to it. So if I have a child object, depending on the null, I can only move the null and the objects would follow. Next we have curbs, arcs, circles, spirals, and squares. These are going to be useful when you start modeling some objects. Let's get an arc, for example. Yeah. For now, we're going to concentrate more on polygon mesh. We have cones, cubes, cylinders, disks, grids, spheres, and the torus. You should get familiar with these models. They're also more complex geometric models. Let's get an octahedron. drawn. Drag, move around. We can scale our object. At the end of polygon mesh, you'll see soccer ball. If we close our property editor, we want to make our soccer ball smaller. Click, scale, drag the center to scale uniformly. Or we can type specific values into X, Y, or Z. Translate and scale.
Inside primitives, we also have surface. Surfaces are nerves or curve-based and are typically used for high-resolution modeling. We'll be focusing on polygon modeling for video games, which means keeping our models looking good, but with the least amount of polygons possible. The implicit models are very similar, except that they don't have geometry. They are curve-based. For example, we get a cube and put it next to our cube. You can see it's a similar shape, but there's no surface. These are also useful to group objects and create hierarchies. We have different types of implicits like spheres, squares, and cones. Control objects are objects that will influence our dynamic simulations. We'll go through this when we start talking more about dynamics. We have wave deformers, gravity, bands, wind. Here's just a simple cage deformer. We'll use this more when we get to modeling. Here we can get more lights and cameras. If we get, for example, here a point light, you can notice how the lighting immediately changes in the scene. If we click on it, translate, we can move the light around using the handles just like we could other geometry. We can move it freely by clicking in the center and dragging it around. Check out how it affects the lighting in the scene. Now that we know how to move objects around the scene, let's see how to center them in our camera view. We'll start with a new scene. Go to File, New Scene. Now let's maximize the camera view by left-clicking on the icon in the right corner. Go to Primitive, Model. Let's select the Face Man. Close up Property Editor and change from Wireframe to Shaded View. Now, I can use the S key and the middle mouse button to zoom in and zoom out of the object. Or we can use another option, which is to click the camera here and go down to our four other options. We have frame selection, center selection, frame all, or reset. If I select the head and press F, the head will center in our view. If we select the eye and press F, the view will center on the eye. Now if you press the S key, with the right mouse button, you will orbit around the selected object. By pressing the A key, the camera will zoom back and display all the objects in the scene. To move the head, select the green null object. Go to Transform, click and drag on the red x-axis. Now let's get another primitive model. Polygon Mesh, Cube, and scale the length. Something about there. And then close the property editor. If I press the F key, I will center on the cube. With the S and the right mouse button, we can orbit around the object. And if we press the A, we'll reveal all the objects in the scene. And if I select the I, press the spacebar or the arrow, 
I can zoom in by pressing the F. If I select the head with the F, I'll center it on the head. Now select the eye and return to the four view layout by left clicking on the icon in the right corner. If I press Shift F, I will center the eye in all four views. If I press Shift A, it will do the same with all the objects in the scene. I can see all the objects in the scene. Shift F, Shift A. Let's talk about camera memories. Camera memories are useful ways to have XSI remember different camera positions you set up within each viewport. Within each viewport, you have four camera memories which you can record and recall at any time. As you hover your mouse over any of the camera memory boxes, look below at the information toolbar for information on how to recall, record, or reset each camera memory. For example, if we center on the cube, when I place the mouse over these boxes, the information toolbar will tell me exactly what happens if I press the left, middle, or right mouse button, we get different options. For example, in this case, I record a view with a middle mouse button. Center, middle mouse button. Frame in on the eye, middle mouse button. Now with the left mouse button, I can quickly go back and check out our other views. Now if I want to change the view, I reposition the camera, right click on the box, and re-record with the middle mouse button. Now I have a saved camera memory. Camera memories work independently in each view, where we can save up to four camera memories in each of our four views. By pressing the Z, I'm able to zoom in the camera. This is useful in your perspective views like top, front, and right. For example, here I can do a zoom, middle mouse button, or right mouse button. Zoom in and out. With the left mouse button, I have handles to move around. Middle mouse button right mouse button. Shift Z will give me a rectangle zoom. A, Shift Z. Now it's telling you the camera memories are useful in three views, except the camera view. Why is that? If I do a zoom in the camera view, it works like a photographic camera. If I zoom in here, we'll get a wide angle view. It's more or less like looking through a fisheye lens. And the perspective can get all distorted. So if you ever need to reset, press R and you'll reset to the original camera position. So let's press Shift Z in the windows. So shift Z in these windows, most of the time, not what you want to do. Let's look at the property editor. Let's get a model, in this case a torus, and by default, it opens with this window. The property editor can be omitted by holding the control key on your keyboard while you click to add a new primitive to the stage. Let's take a closer look. First, the property page gives us the model name. Then we have the construction parameters, in this case, the radius, the cross sections, the subdivision mode. Let's turn it to our shaded view, it'll be much easier to see. And then here we can specify how many subdivisions this model will have. Here we have the start and ending angle in U, which is horizontal, and in V, which is our vertical. If you look at the parameters, each one has a little green icon. This means that this parameter can be animated. We'll go through this a lot more when we get to our animation section, but it's really simple. We just click to make a keyframe, change some of our parameters, move down the timeline, and place another keyframe. If I get another model, in this case a sphere, 
We move it around. We move it off. Move it to this side. If I select the torus, the properties page will refresh to the selected model. Switching back to the sphere or switching back to the torus, and the property editor will refresh to the selected model. If I want to keep the sphere's property page, you'll see three icons here. The first one is recycle, focus, and lock. I'll select lock for now. Now if I select the torus, the page will not refresh. It'll stay on the torus's property editor. If I press enter, a second window will pop open. Now we have both property editors. Now we have the sphere, and this one is the torus. And we can now continue to modify the sphere and the torus. If now I click on refresh, select another model, both windows will refresh and act as a single window. We can also move around the property editor, clicking on the bar and dragging. We can minimize, move it around, and maximize. With a double click, we collapse and lock the window. We can then get another property editor. Work with the other one. And when we need this one, we just double click on it and return to our previous window. Let's take a look at two other views, the Explorer and the Schematic. We can select the window to be our Explorer. The window will open with a tree-like hierarchy view with all the elements in the scene. Here we can see cameras, lights, models, and everything we have included in our scene. In another window, we can select the schematic view. This is an icon-based view. Here, for example, if we want to select the camera, we open this tree, we have the camera and the interest. When we can also see the schematic view. Here we have a light and a torus. In this case, the schematic represents exactly what we see in the Explorer. Some people are more used to working in the schematic view and some are more comfortable in the Explorer. I think it depends on what you're working on. We can make these windows float to clear up our views. We can get the Explorer by pressing the 8 and the schematic by pressing 9. This way, we can work with only our perspective view and by pressing the 8 key, we get the Explorer. We can even double click to collapse and double click again to open. With a 9 key, we can bring up our floating schematic. This way, we can even work with both at the same time. Now let's see how hierarchies work. We'll get another model, uh, a sphere. To see how the Explorer works, we have here a sphere and a torus. They both are children to what we call the scene root which also by default contains our cameras and our lights. Here you'll see a yellow H. This means that the elements are hidden. We can select the child objects, the camera, and the interests. By pressing H on the keyboard, these elements will appear. Let's open a new user view. Now we can see the elements, the camera, and the interests. I can also select the Explorer, the Sphere, or the Torus. To be able to select the perspective view, we can select it using the big arrow. Or by pressing spacebar. Let me hide our cameras again. Select them and hit H. I recenter. Now let's see how to select multiple objects. If we click and drag the mouse, our object would be selected. But for example, if we had multiple spheres, now if I select one, and also want to select the one beneath, we lose our original selection. The selection process works exactly like the Windows environment. With Control, I can toggle the selection of an object. With Shift, I can add to the selection. Now with dragging, and control, I can do a toggle selection. With shift, I can continue adding. And with control, I can go ahead and remove. Or with shift, I can add everything to the selection. It's basically the same as selecting files in Windows OS. 
Now let's try to use the Explorer to select. We can use the Control key to select multiple objects. With Control, I can keep adding or removing. With Shift, I can select the rest. And with Control, we can pick and choose to add or remove. Shift to wrench or Control to toggle. Let's open the browser by pressing 5 on your keyboard. Make sure you're in Database 101. Go to Scenes, Interface, and open Chapter 6 Explorer. We can simplify our Explorer so that it will only show us our selection. If I select the cube, the Explorer will filter only that selection and show me only information relative to that object. So in this case, we can keep exploring the cube to see its materials and its construction history. If we select other objects, the Explorer will refresh. I can also set the lock. So now if I select other objects, the window will not refresh. Now we have different filters like scene, passes, materials, etc. By default, we work in the scene route. In this case, it shows me all the models that are in the scene and also all the animatable parameters. So if we explore the torus, we can see the little green icons that mean these properties can be animated. If I change my scope to only objects, now we only see the objects in the Explorer. All right, we're gonna talk about hierarchies. Go to one-on-one -on -one database, scenes, interface, and open chapter six, hierarchies. Now your screen should look like so. Hierarchies are parent-child relationships in which the properties of the parent are propagated to the child. I can modify a child without affecting the parent, but whatever I do to the parent is going to affect the child. In this case, for example, we're going to build this hierarchy where we have two cylinders that are children of the torus. I can select the object that will be the children, click on parent, and down in the information bar, we can see what the left, middle, and right mouse button will now do. With the left mouse button, we can pick a child. With the middle mouse button, we can pick a parent. And with the right mouse button, we can terminate the tool. So we want a parent. Middle click on the torus, and right click to end the tool. Now if you look in the Explorer, you open the torus, you see it has two children. By pressing nine, I can open my schematic view. Rearrange all. Control R, refresh. Press F to frame or focus on the object. And here we have an icon-based representation of what we see. Now let's make the cube a child of the cylinder. We can also go and click on the parent, but this time we'll do it in Explorer. Since all the objects are named almost the same, it will be easier if we add some colors to the scene. Click down here on the palette, click on a color, click on an object, right-click to end the session. You can now choose another color, select some other objects to be that color, and right-click to end the session and so on. Take note that the Explorer also represents the color of the wireframe, the same as the schematic. Now I want my cube to be a child of the yellow cylinder. So click on parent and we can select an Explorer in the schematic or in the perspective view. If we middle click on the cylinder, control R to refresh the schematic, and if we open the Explorer and expand the cylinder, we can see our child object. Now this cube has two children, which are the two spheres, so we control click the two spheres and middle click to drag the cube. We open the cube and we have the two children. Let's control R to refresh. Now we have the torus, the two cylinders, the cube, and the two children spheres. Now if we wanted to break up this relationship and change the two children to the cylinder here, I can go to the Explorer, select the two children, middle mouse button, and drag them to the new parent in this case, the cylinder. And that changes our relationship. I have the new parent and the new children. This is one way we can manipulate the relationships in the scene. Now, if we rotate the parent, you'll see all the children will follow. And if I scale, all the values are propagated to the children. If I rotate this one, it will only go down to the children. The same if I scale it. If I scale this one, since it has no children, only the cube will be modified. But if I scale this cylinder, 
the cube will be affected because it is a child. Also, if we rotate. To break a hierarchy, I can select an object and click on the cut button. And the hierarchy is broken. I just drew in these lines to represent the hierarchy, so don't worry about those. I'm just going to delete them here. So if we want to break up this hierarchy, I click here, cut, or I can also select an object, middle click, drag it back to the scene route. This will also break up a hierarchy. Or if I click cut, we'll go directly to the scene route. All right, let's open up our browser, press 5. Make sure you're in the database 101. Go to Scenes, Interface. And open Chapter 7, Hierarchies. And now we'll talk about our selection options. If you're in the selection mode, and you want to look at the status display, we'll see three options. Our left mouse button, select a node. Middle mouse button, select a branch. And our right mouse button, will select the tree. This is regarding hierarchies. If I click, I can select each model by itself. And if I press the control key, I can select different models. If I scale each model independently, Say I want to select the whole branch, I middle click, select the parent, and this selects the parent along with the children. Parent and the two children. Left mouse button to select the node, middle mouse button to select the branch. Left mouse button to select the node, middle mouse button to select the parent and its children. Parent, parent and children. If we want to select a hierarchy, I can click select in any of the objects that form a hierarchy, but this time we will be using the right mouse button. This selection automatically explores the hierarchy and goes node by node until the parent is reached. This will easily select the parent and all of its children. You can see in the explorer how the hierarchy is represented. In white we have the parent and in gray we have the children. There's also a tool called Child Compensate. This tool is useful if, say, we want to rescale or move the parent object without affecting the children. If I scale the torus, the children will be affected by the transformation. But if we click Child Compensate, I can replace, scale, and move around the parent object without affecting the children. Once we stop Child Compensate, the children will receive the parent transformations. Let's get a primitive model and get the biped box. To better understand hierarchies, we're going to take a simple default character from XSI, add and parent a couple pre-made elements, and use the hierarchical structure to pose the model in a crouched shooting position. If we bring up our schematic view by pressing 9, we can explore the biped box. Shift Z to zoom. First, you'll see our global SRT, which is the father of the hierarchy. By selecting it, we can transform the entire hierarchy. Move it. Scale it. So I can move and replace my character. Then we have the upper body. If we rotate, the children will follow. And then we have the children. In this case, 
one of the first bones of the vertebrae, left and right thighs. You can explore the legs. From the thigh, we have the shin. If we rotate the thigh, the shin will follow. Rotate the shin, the foot, and the toes. This is a hierarchy structure. If we work with the arm, we have the shoulder. Turn to the local. Switching to local will allow you to rotate each object along its own coordinates independently of the global scene coordinates. Forearm. And the hand. The hand subdivides to the fingers. You'll see our chest, the head, the neck. If we rotate the neck, the head will follow. Now we have a head. So this is a poseable character. Let's work on a pose. Let's see, we can add some elements and apply them directly to hierarchy. We'll add a gun and a helmet. Then we'll use the hierarchy to help pose him in a crouch shooting position. Go to models. With this button here, I can choose the thumbnails. And I have a helmet and a gun. Click on the helmet and drag it into our perspective view. Do the same with the gun. Press 8 to get the Explorer. And as you can see, our objects are now part of the hierarchy. The helmet, and then the gun. So select the objects, click and cut. Select the unused hierarchies and delete them. Now we have the bipod box, the helmet, and the gun. All right, let's start with the helmet. Click on V. We'll press here, go to Transform. Press F to frame, and it's applied quite well. With the gun, we're going to have to do a bit more adjusting. The first thing we want to do is tell the helmet to be the child of the head. So select the parent. We have a big section. And middle click on the head. Right click to end. So if I select the head and rotate, the helmet will follow. Let's try to fix a little bit of the detail in the back. Since the helmet is a child object, I can select the helmet and move it back a little. That looks better. Now if I rotate the neck, you'll see the head follow. And if I rotate the head, the helmet will follow. Perfect. All right, let's place the gun. Something that will be really useful is to rotate the hand into a more natural position. Something like this. Now select the gun. Move it. Place it next to the palm. With F, we can reframe. Uh, center in, place it where we want it. Uh, I'm going to scale it just a bit more. X for scale. Work on the middle to get a uniform scaling. V to move. And just place it right there. And 
more or less. All right, let's rotate it a little bit. And now we have to arrange our fingers. Select the finger, rotate. Next one. Let's practice a little bit out. All right, continue to place the finger. It's going to be the trigger, so I want a little bit off, so the guy's not shooting anyone. Now we can select the rest of the fingers. And we're going to rotate the fingers. But this time, instead of rotating local, seeing what happens, we're going to rotate with an additive rotate. What this does is the rotational values of the parent are added to each of the children. So when I rotate, we get a much more natural reaction in the fingers. This way I can close the fingers and get a more you know, natural grip. All right, let's go back to local. Rotate the gun a little bit more. Something like this. Move it in a little bit. Let's work with the thumb. A little bit to the inside. Don't worry right now if the finger is kind of messed up and broken. Uh, we can mess with it more in a little bit. We'll make it look good. All right, rotate a little bit more to the outside. Down. And this guy. Up. And this one. The same way we made the helmet a child of the head, we're going to do to the gun. Because now, if I rotate, the palm of the gun will not follow, since right now it's not in the hierarchy. So let's select the gun. Click on Parent. I'm going to click on the palm, and right-click to finish. Now if I rotate the palm, see the gun follows. Pretty cool. The head works okay. All right, we can look at the hierarchy with 9, F to frame. You'll see we have the hand and the gun. In this case, we have the neck, the head, and the helmet. Now we're going to pose our model. If you remember, the upper body has control of what's happening to the whole body. So I'm going to start by placing this object more or less in the position that I want. Rotate it a little bit, like this. Now let's continue posing the rest of the object. Select our leg, rotate. Like so. Uh, and it will be open about that much. Same with the foot. Just go in to get the balance. Let's just balance our guy up. Now the left leg. So it has to be touching the ground. Select the upper body and pull it down. Let's select the other leg. Rotate it upwards. Kind of rotate this one, like so. Yeah, we can rotate the whole guy just a little bit. Like that. And now we have to balance the body. So select his vertebrae.
try to get a little bit of balance out of him. Uh, a little bit less. That looks better. Uh, maybe a bit forward. Okay. Now the shoulders. The arm. Forearm. Let's put him in a little bit more of aggressive position here. Yeah, I like that. Uh, this one, not that much. I'll make it a bit more natural. We can rotate the head, uh, the neck, like this. And use the right hand for support. That's a little bit better, a little more natural. Let's move it out a little bit. This one, rotate it inward, get a little closer to the other hand. And then the hand itself. Now we can close the fingers as support. Grabbing them like so. And the rest of the fingers. Select all of them. Press C for rotate. Select additive. All right, and C for center. So we have an extra model here. Control selection off. Rotate on the additive. And we close the fingers. A little bit less. And these three. This other one, and the last one. All right, rotate this guy a little bit more. There we have it. There it is. If we look at the hierarchy, click here and change to an object only view. Explore around. You can see we have the upper body, the thighs, the children of the thighs, the vertebrae, until we get to the shoulders. The neck. The neck has the head, and the head has the helmet. Uh, let's see, press 9 for schematic. We have the whole body. Just tweak a little bit more. Rotate this guy out. Like so. Rotate this guy a little bit more.
And yeah, I think we have it. Now let's save the scene. Change it to render. Region. Select the region tool. Click and drag to make a rectangle. And when we release, XSI will start to render that area. Now if we go to File, Save As, uh, check the database you want to work on. Let's see. Go to Scenes. In this case, Section 1, Chapter 8. Choose a name. Uh, yep, copy the external files if you want. Click OK. So now the next time I open the file, the render will be used as an icon. Perfect. And that's it. You got a guy. Let's start by getting a primitive polygon mesh cone. Turn to the shaded view. Maximize with a left click. Uh, let's make it a bit taller. Change the radius like so. All right, when I select an object, I have the information in the transformation toolbar. If I click on scale, wherever I place my pointer, I get this indicator of what I can transform. I can just click and drag this axis. If I click and drag the middle, I'll scale uniformly in all three axes or just one. For example, this is the y-axis. I can also lock one single axis, so even if I move around, I will only affect uh, the selected axis. And we can get back by double-clicking in the middle, and we can uniformly scale all three axes. The same thing with rotation. We have three colored axes. Each color represents one of the three axes. There's x, uh, Z here, and Y. Or I can click outside and move them around in a free mode. And again with translate. In the translation mode, we have global and local transformations. The global axis is reference to the center of the universe. In this case, 0, 0, 0 is represented by the center of the grid. Uh, so in this case here, the cone is located in the global center at 0, 0, 0. So my local coordinates will be the same as my global coordinates. Furthermore, if I move my object out of the center of the universe and I rotate it, my global coordinates are not the 0, 0, 0 we had originally. And if you look at the axis, it's still pointing up at the center of the universe. If I want to move the cone diagonally in the direction that it's, the tip here is pointing, it's not really the exact way of moving it in the global. So if we click on its local coordinates, you can see how the axis will change. The green axis, which is the y-axis, is pointing now in the same direction as the cone. So if I drag the axis, it will move in the direction in which the cone is pointing. Global corresponds to the axis in the center of the universe and local corresponds to the axis of the object. This is really important to understand. Uh, it's going to be really useful when you're modeling. Our modeling options will depend on the local or the global coordinates. So let's try it again. Let's get a sphere and we'll see how this affects modeling. By pressing U, you can select polygons. Control D to duplicate that polygon. So if I'm in global mode, it will move in reference to the center of the universe, in the grid. If I want the polygon to be extruded in the direction of the axis, I would have to switch to local mode and just drag it this way. The same with every other face. Local. One little one up here. In the opposite of global, you can see the difference. If I pull it up and down, it will go to the reference of the global axis, not the local object axis.
Let's get a grid and go through the different selection options. By default, we're in object mode. We can explore the model further by selecting its points, edges, and polygons. Edges, uh, in this case, the yellow lines, or polygons, which will be the contents of those yellow lines. If I'm in polygon mode, and I click and drag, I will select polygons this way. The same with points and edges. If I select a polygon, I can go ahead and transform the polygon with the scale, rotation, and translation. The shortcut for scale is X, rotation is C, and translation, V. With X, I can scale, V to move. The same will work with the points. If I select the points, I can move them around, scale them, and transform. If you select points here and here, I want to scale them, you press the X key, and they will scale independently in this way. But I can also scale them in relation to the average between these points. I have an option here, which is center of gravity. When I click center of gravity, and then scale, it will use the average of the point selected, and will scale in reference to that center. This will be really useful when you're modeling. If I release it, the transformations will again work independently. Again, if I activate it, the transformations will work according to the average. Because Soft Image is text-based, finding the tool you're looking for can be more intuitive than in many other 3D applications. We have Get, Create, and Modify. Let's get a polygon model. Uh, for now, a cube. Now we can either create other objects from this cube or modify the cube. So we want to create. We have curves and surface mesh, which we're not going to use right now. We're focused on create polygon mesh. And we have fairly different objects we can use. If we select subdivision, we'll create a rounded subdivided object from the cube. It retains a modeling reference to the cube. So we create a polygon mesh from the model we have already selected. We'll explain subdivisions a bit more in section two. So if we select a polygon from this cube, press U, which is a shortcut for polygon, we can create a polygon from that selected polygon. So we create a polygon mesh and select extract the polygon with delete. This creates a brand new polygon, deleting the existing polygon from the cube. These two objects are still referenced to one another. By pressing the M key, I can move a component around. This is an independent object. If I want to modify, let's get another polygon mesh, a cylinder, add some subdivisions in the vertical, add a little bit of height. With this cylinder, I can either create it or modify. Let's explore the modify. Inside modify, we have the form. We can add a bulge. Let's try that. Deform it a little bit. Offset in our Y axis. Adjust the fall off. We can mute the operator. And let's try another deformation. Uh, in this case, a bend. We can play with the values. Offset, a little bit more angle. 
and radius. If I go back and release the bulge operator, I have the two operators that I can play with. This time, let's get a grid. Now, depending on the component we have selected, if we use our right mouse button, we get a different set of options. Let's try grow. We can grow our selection, and it will select the surrounded points. If I right click and again select grow, the selection will continue to grow. I can select dissolve components, and the components will be deleted, but not the polygon. Now, if we select the polygon, pressing the U key, right mouse button, we have our menu. We can select the grow. Or try and extrude. And we get an extruded polygon. Or an inset, for example, which will duplicate and scale our polygon if we select an edge. If we select the edge, the right mouse button will give us a different option. We can try a bevel, for example. So all the menus are relative to what component we have selected. In this case, the object is selected and we don't have a menu. But I do have my transformation options. Experiment right-clicking on different components to familiarize yourself with the different options found within the context menus. Press 5 to open the browser. Make sure you're in Database 101. Go to Scenes, Interface, Open, Chapter 10, Merge. In the following sample, I have two simple polygon cylinders, which I'll merge into a single object. And I would like the Merge tool to create the missing polygons in between for me. So we can click and select both objects. Go to Create, Poly Mesh, and we select the Merge. Let's click the Lock. And we have a tolerance, which is the gap between the two objects. And as you can see, the, sli the slider value is just not going to be enough. So we can go ahead, click on tolerance, and put a numeric value. With this button, we will hide or unhide the objects that we use to create this model. So if we move the created objects upwards, I still have my original models, so we can hide them or unhide them. If you press delete, the operator and the objects will be erased. We have a new model created from the other objects. Press 5 again to open the browser. Make sure you're in Database 101. Go to Scenes, Interface, Open, Chapter 10, Hide, Unhide. We will now learn how to hide or unhide objects from our scene. At one point, if we want to work with our sphere, we can select the torus and press the H on the keyboard. If we look at our explorer, you'll notice a yellow H appears on that object. Since it is selected, if we press the H, it will unhide the object. If we hide it again and then deselect it, if we press H again, we will not be able to unhide that object. We have to reselect the object and press the H key. If we have many objects hidden, we can go to display and select unhide all objects and all my objects reappear. The hide object will also work with selected polygons. If we click and select half of the polygons of the torus, we press H, we're hiding half of the torus. This allows me to work on my sphere more clearly without having to erase other objects. If I want my polygons back, 
I will go to display, unhide all polygons, and all of my hidden polygons are revealed again. Press 5 to open the browser. Make sure you're in Database 101. Go to Scenes, Interface, and Chapter 11 for Groups. Now let's talk about groups, which are going to help us manage our scene. You can use groups to organize complex scenes or different areas from within your own model or to apply different properties to a group of objects. Let's start by creating a sphere group. Select the spheres, click on group. Our group is created with selected models. If we want to add objects to that group, select the objects in the Explorer, right click on the group, and select Add to Group. All my objects still appear on the Explorer and also appear in the group. This means objects can be part of multiple groups. With the middle mouse button, I can select the object in that group, and they are also selected in this part of the scene root. Go ahead and select the four cylinders. The shortcut for creating a group is Control G. Press that, and a cylinder group is created. If you look at the group options, we have view visibility, which will hide or unhide objects in our view, render visibility, if you click and drag with a Q, we'll open a render window. By selecting hide from the render visibility, we will hide the objects from the render view. By pressing shift Q, I can hide the render view. And you can see the objects are still in my work area, but they do not appear in the render. You can make the object selectable or not selectable. This means if they are not selectable, I cannot select them in my view, but I can still select them in the Explorer. If we turn off selectability, you'll notice we can't select the objects in the view, and in the Explorer, they turn a grayish color. I can still select other objects in the viewport, but not the cylinders. If I want to make them selectable again, we can select the group, selectivity, and make them selectable. The selectability options can also be per model. It does not have to be per group. For example, if I select this sphere, Click on Selection, Visibility. I have the options for that model. We have similar options for the group. We have View Visibility, Render Visibility, and Selectability. If I deselect this option, and you look at the wireframe, you'll see that the object is a grayish color. That means that it's not currently selectable. Now if I went over to select the sphere, it's impossible to do so in the perspective view. I would have to go to my Explorer, select the object. We can do it again in Selection. Or change our filter type to All plus Animatable Parameters. Export the object, Visibility. We can single click on the icon or double click on the name. And reselect Selectability. We can also apply this to all the selected objects. And we don't have to go object by object. Select one object, open its visibility windows, leave the window open, and select all the other objects that you want to affect. The property editor turns to a multi-property page. From here, we can affect all the selected objects. In this case, the cylinders are not affected because they are part of a group, and groups automatically override single object properties. Let's try selectability. If we deselect it, we find all the objects are no longer selectable. The blue arrow indicates that some are also part of a group. 
if we select our cylinder group and open its properties page, select the view visibility, and select no effect in members, now the blue arrow disappears and we can affect it with the multi property page. So the group has higher priority over the objects options. If we select render, no effect in members, in the multi property page, we can select or deselect window visibility. All right, let's go through the layers. Layers are very similar to working with groups. The shortcut for the layer toolbar is number six on the keyboard. If we press it, our layer editor appears. We always have a default layer, which includes all the objects in the scene. We can hide them from our view, hide them from render, or make them unselectable, just like our groups. Creating a new layer is fairly simple. Click layer, new layer, you can put in the layer name. If you click on layer visibility, nothing will happen because we don't have any objects in that layer. So we select the second layer as the active layer, go to the layer move and select the current layer. So the objects are moved. And since the visibility is hidden, the object will disappear. So you have one layer or the second layer. Here we have the selectability that makes them unselectable. Also, turn off visibility, but since the layer render is selected, they will show in my render view. Visibility, selectability. Another way to create a layer is to select the objects, click Layer, and New Layer from Selection. We now have the objects in that selection on a new layer. Visibility. We can also use the Explorer to see the contents of our layers. We can change the scope to Layers, or press the L key, and in the list of layers, we have Layer 2 with the spheres, Layer 3 with the cylinders, and our default layer. If you want to change the cylinder to the second layer, we middle click on the object and drag it to the selected layer, and see if the object moves layers. This means that the objects cannot be in two layers, unlike our groups, where we can have multiple objects in different groups. We can drag this to layer 2, but the objects can only be in one layer at a time. This means they are exclusive from other layers. In this way, we can organize a complex model or a big scene. If we have a really large scene like a city, we can hide objects to work more efficiently. In one layer, we could have our street, and in another layer, we could have additional objects like lamp posts or street signs. We could even have a layer of cars which we turn on or off. Version 5 of XSI also has a layer with a layout editor included in the interface. It's the same floating window, but it's embedded within the interface. And we also have the keying panel. This is a transformer panel per object, and we have the information of each object in its position, rotation, and scaling, its visibility and render visibility. This can be per object or for multiple objects. And it will also allow us to put keyframes in this window. We can rack the values with a virtual slider. Just click and drag on the numeric values. We can also click and add a specific numerical value to the window. And if we control select the values, we can place a numeric value for the three options. So if we put a numeric value of five, it will change into X, Y, and Z. If we put a numeric value of 1, it will restore to its original size. If we put in a value of 0, it will reset its position to 0. The same with rotation in 0. We have the layer editor and the keying panel.